Hello, my name is Becky Menzel, and I am the Genealogy Librarian for the Spokane Public Library. In this video, I will be talking about tips and tricks for reading the handwriting in older documents. Paleography is the study of ancient and historical handwriting, and while you can hire someone with this specialty or purchase software to transcribe your document, I hope that this video will help you to at least get more comfortable deciphering old handwriting yourself and save time and money in your genealogy research. If you have ever had to read any handwritten documents, you have encountered the dilemma of a record you cannot make sense of, no matter how hard you squint. This can be because the image is a copy of a copy, the writer had terrible handwriting, or you never learned cursive. Whatever the issue, I have a few tips to help get past the problem. With the example at the bottom left, the writer appears to have been hurrying and the names are difficult to read. On the right, the document is faded, which is probably a scanning issue. Sometimes you will get lucky and find the same document in a different database where there is a better scan. Even if the handwriting is readable, you may still have trouble deciphering the letters or names, such as in the example top left. At first glance, it can look like chicken scratchings. But with a bit of manipulation and a refresher in cursive, the task of deciphering them will be easier. The first thing I recommend is to make sure you know what language you are trying to read. Occasionally the handwriting is so bad I can't even tell if it's English. Today I will be focusing on English, but all alphabets are different, so a record in German won't read the same as one in English. Unless you are familiar with the foreign language, it might be best to get a professional to help you. Many German documents were written in Old German, which is more confusing than Modern German, and church documents are often written in Latin. Contacting your local university may be helpful as a language student or teacher might be of assistance in deciphering your document. Once you have determined the language, it can be a good idea to refresh your memory when it comes to cursive. Cursive method was popular because it required fewer pen lifts, was believed to increase speed, and was less likely to break the quill, which was fragile and tended to leave blobs on the paper. However, fewer people are learning how to write in cursive, and those who did may not use it or be used to reading it. Most older handwritten documents will be in cursive. These are some cheat sheets for remembering cursive. You can Google cursive genealogy for more examples. I would suggest writing a letter or even a paragraph out in cursive to familiarize yourself with it. Also, keeping the charts handy when you are reading the document can be helpful, so you can refer to examples of how the letters are constructed, especially as there are at least three different forms of cursive that were taught in school. A good example of a letter written multiple different ways is Q. In the top left example, the Q is written in three different ways, italic, ligature, and looped. Sometimes the word can be a combination of more than one type. A good way to become familiar with the handwriting is by reading more than one page or line of the document you are trying to read. It may take several pages to begin to recognize the letters and what the words are. Sometimes punctuation and capitalization can help to break up the document into sections that are easier to read. Place a line over each period to break up the sentence. Read it out loud or print it out and trace over the letters to try to decipher the words. Reading in context can also help to decipher words. While the word on the postcard at the lower left looks like XLUS, by reading the sentence, how is school, blank, year, it becomes obvious the word is this. Knowing where the writer lived can also help, as knowing a place name can be a clue when deciphering handwriting. This word is Fairhaven, as the writer lived in Rhode Island, near to Fairhaven, Connecticut. One can be thrown off by run-on sentences and lack of punctuation, but remember they were probably writing quickly and didn't have spell check or automatic grammar correction. Once you've figured out what the letters look like, it's time to figure out spelling. Spelling wasn't standardized until the late 19th century when schools began to teach spelling as a subject. Although the first reliable dictionary was published in 1755, it wasn't a common household item. Most people spelled words the way they heard them. This was complicated by early spelling rules and abbreviations. One of the most common is the S that looks like an F. Many phrases are Latin in origin. When writing out dates, instead of simply stating the month and day, the abbreviations INST and ULT were used. 
The ampersand and DO also refer to Latin terms. Someone reading this when it was written would have understood immediately, but we have a bit of a 21st century learning curve to overcome. Google is a good way to try to figure out what a phrase or abbreviation is and what it means. Some formal documents have standard lines that can help to decipher writing. Common phrases in wills are, I give and bequeath, and being of sound mind, although spelling can vary, as these examples show. In the top document, the writer used the plus symbol to denote and, and the use of esquire is usually in reference to either a lawyer or a man of property and wealth. The person who wrote the bottom document used a fancy curl under the S that occurred at the end of a word, which resembles a cursive lowercase z, the sound of the letter written. When writing names, sometimes an abbreviation, abbreviated form was used as it was often believed to save time and paper. Later, the use of a man's initials was common practice. Sometimes titles are misread as first names, and some first names are titles. Here, Colonel is a seven-year-old boy. Pinky later went by Paul, and Babe was 22 days old and later named Wade. The Reverend J.R. Borden was a Methodist minister, and his honorific was added to the census record. While these are common name abbreviations, they are by no means an exhaustive list. Googling English name abbreviations, or the abbreviation itself, can help you figure out the name you are looking for. If you find a page that is very difficult to read, some manipulation may be in order. Try inverting the colors if you can, or print it out and trace the lines you can see. Family Search allows you to invert and manipulate the image, while Ancestry lets you invert the image. Sometimes saving and opening the document in a program, such as Adobe, can help when a document was written on both sides, or can make faint handwriting clearer. Faded ink or poor writing equipment can compound the problem of trying to read a document, as can corrections squeezed onto the page. Often numbers such as dates or measurements were written out. Try reading the document out loud. If you can't read the page you are on, move forward or back a few pages to see if the handwriting improves. Sometimes printing out and underlying capitalized letters can help understand the composition of the document. In this land deed, I initially read the river as Walston, until I googled it and discovered it was Holston. I was aided by using the name Bowman, which is a town in Blount County, helping to narrow down my search of rivers in Tennessee. I also had to look up the term chain, which is a unit of length equal to 66 feet, or 22 yards. If you don't recognize a word or how it's used, Google can be a great resource for out-of-use terms. While there are many documents that are easy to read, hopefully if you come across one that isn't, you now have a few new tricks in your genealogy toolbox. The more practice you have, the easier reading documents can get. There are still some that stump me, and I find that sometimes two heads are better than one, and social media can be a way to share your dilemma if you are home alone wrestling with a document. It can be worth it to keep trying, as you might have the next piece of the puzzle right at your fingertips.